All right. Good morning, everybody. So, um, start just with a little bit of background as to who I am. Uh, consultant in sort of well-being policy and measurement. Um, and I recently wrote this book, The Happiness Problem. So we're going to be talking all about happiness uh, this week. And so just kind of, it's a bit of an unusual, I guess, uh, career trajectory that I've been on. So I thought I'd give you a little bit of background as to where I'm coming from um, and therefore why I've sort of ended up um, looking into the things I have and, and why I think they're so important. So it all began um, probably about 15 years ago now. Uh, I did a lot of activism when I was at university in Bristol and I, it was the sort of quite sort of global campaigns, so kind of campaigns to sort of eradicate extreme poverty um, or for uh, trade justice and, and things like that. And I hadn't been doing it for that long before getting disillusioned, so pretty much by the end of my time at university, I, I kind of already was disillusioned about the fact that people didn't seem to care um, and also I, all, all the things that I was interested in were about rising people's um, level of kind of material prosperity um, and uh, um, getting the world, you know, sort of equally prosperous so they could all be happy. And I was sort of looking around, uh, around where I live, in Bristol and the rest of the UK and, and sort of thinking, but, but people aren't happy anyway. And I was fairly sure that, that happiness was what we were kind of all sort of looking for. Um, and uh, yeah, it didn't seem like with all the, all the wealth and all the uh, opportunities and resources that we have in our lives that um, we, we were necessarily happy as a result. We, I, I saw many of my friends were very stressed or, or ill. Um, it didn't seem like we had um, time to do the things in life that seemed to really matter, like um, spend time with people or appreciate each day as it comes. We seem to live in the future a lot um, and be anxious about things. So. That's kind of what got me sort of thinking, huh, okay, well maybe, you know, all this campaigning is is relatively useless unless uh, there is a, a way of being happy at the end of it. Um, and um, it, I sort of stumbled across the study of happiness at this point. Uh, it was It's a relatively new field of study in, in sort of psychology and economics, and economics tends to be called the... the happiness economics and in um, psychology it tends to be called positive psychology. Together they kind of form this sort of science of happiness. It's sort of been around since the 70s really but only started to get popular in the kind of 90s onwards. And I discovered it and I thought well this is brilliant you know I, I wanted to I've got all these sort of intuitions about what makes people happy and the fact that people aren't so happy and, and these scientists are starting to, to say which which ones are right and, and which ones might be wrong and, and so okay I thought I'd um, delve into this and uh, figure out what would make everyone happy and then implement that and, and save the world. It, well, to cut a long story short, I ended up doing a PhD uh, which wasn't the original plan but I ended up doing a PhD in the study of happiness at the University of Leeds and about four years later came out not with, well, kind of with all the answers as to what made people happy, but um, with a lot more questions around that. And we'll get into that this week. Uh, and um, yeah, I guess like most people do when they start reading uh, stuff, especially in academia, realizing that things are always um, a little bit complicated and not so simple exactly. Um, so. I finished PhD, I still wanted to kind of go into the real world and try and change uh, people's lives rather than just think about this stuff. So I went into the world of 
uh, wellbeing policy, which is, again, it's fairly new. It was building upon um, this science. I don't know if, if people kind of come across um, these sort of movements for like, for well, it's big in Scotland, actually, uh, with Nicola Sturgeon, really interested in new metrics of um, prosperity and, and well-being. Um, and so that's what I dived into to kind of try and move society away from sort of economic growth and, and just material wealth and look at more sort of holistic measures of well-being. Um, and I've spent the past uh, five years doing that. Um, but then, he, but then through that, it's similar to the PhD. I um, I had this kind of what what felt like a very simple idea at the beginning of, of sort of implementing these new measures, um, implement, implementing new ways of doing policy to to improve people's lives, it was actually very complicated in practice, and people seem to be making the same sort of mistakes that I think I made at the beginning um, of my PhD when thinking about how to make everyone happy. And so I kind of came to this conclusion a couple of years ago that actually people were thinking about happiness wrong. So not just what makes us happy. In fact, I think we're actually quite good at knowing what makes us happy. It, the, the entire concept, I think people... Uh, or, or society at large uh, is thinking about wrong. So the way we are thinking about happiness is problematic. Um, and that all sounds a bit abstract. Um, and uh, to some extent it is, uh, but we'll be looking at that this week in a, in a quite a um, real practical sense, really. Um, there, yeah, this, this, when we get down to what all this theory means for our own lives, I think there's actually very few answers and it's a very personal endeavour as to what is right for, for me and what is right for you. And yeah, that's something I'm sure we will explore. Um, so the book that I, that I wrote um, really kind of begins by looking at um, a sort of, of wealth of, of different studies from sort of neuroscience, anthropology, evolutionary biology, to really kind of understand um, what the, the nature of our minds are um, and what the different functions of our mental capacities are um, in order to understand um, what happiness is all about. So I draw upon this distinction, which is now... Um, kind of gaining more and more um, uh, clout, I guess, uh, in cognitive science. Um, it's, it's sort of, people are really paying much more attention to this these days, which is our two quite fundamental capacities, and it's not just humans, but almost all mammals, almost all foraging animals, have kind of fundamental capacities for what I call control, on the one hand, and connection on the other. What are they? So when I talk about control, I mean um, effectively our ability to get and have stuff. So to change our circumstances so that uh, our lives are better. And we do this by employing a range of, of other capacities. We, we kind of begin by sorting the world into kind of good things and bad things uh, or right things and wrong things or shoulds and shouldn'ts, um, groups and categories. And then we use this sort of all these things that we've figured out, all these beliefs that we've got um, to then try and get more of the good things and less of the bad things. So we employ goals and planning and commitments and various other things like that. Um, that's what control is all about. It's about everything we have learned um, so that we can improve our lives by kind of um, manipulating them, by having power over reality as it were, uh, using our resources uh, and opportunities to improve things. Now, connection, on the other hand, I'm, I'm using that word um, in a bit of a nuanced way. So I'm not just talking about the kind of 
bonds and relationships we have with our, our sort of friends, uh, loved ones, family, acquaintances, colleagues, and so on. What I mean by connection is a kind of um, connection with reality itself, connection with the world. Another way of thinking about it is how in touch we are with reality. Um, connection and touch, they're very uh, related things. Um, yeah, so are we connected to ourselves? Are we connected to uh, others? Are we connected to the world around us? Um, and these capacities uh, for connection are really about uh, our capacities, not necessarily for like changing our circumstances, for for manipulating um, our world in ways that we like, but therefore opening our attention, therefore um, being interested and curious in the world, therefore exploring possibilities. Um, therefore potential insights and revelations. So they're all about really not kind of diving into reality and, and trying to sort it out in the ways that we want it to be, trying to control it to our liking. They're more about stepping back, seeing what reality is already like and seeing what we can learn from that. So there's a kind of um, fundamental distinction that I'm gonna go back to throughout this entire week. I think it's, it's, it's hugely important. Um, like I say, it's, it exists for not just humans, but any kind of foraging animal. It's really the two fundamental capacities you have if you want to, on the one hand, change the world, but on the other hand, um, have limited information. So we always need to be, to some extent, open to new ways of changing the world, to new ideas, to the fact that we could be completely wrong. So, um, what does always have to do with happiness? Well, in the book again, I talk a lot about how at least for the past 250 years, from the Industrial Revolution onwards, uh, we have lived in an increasingly control-based society. So, we tend to think about our lives in terms of um, control, in terms of how we have maybe a life plan and we're going to achieve certain things at certain points in time in order to get and have the things that we think make up a good life, right? Um, now, for some people, this might be relatively shallow things like I want a big fast car and a, and a big fancy house and so on. For other people, it might be really deep stuff like I want to have a, a healthy and happy family or I want to contribute to society, who knows. But they're still based around getting and having stuff. Um, and that's, I think, how we uh, typically think about happiness too. We have phrases like, um, if only I had a loving relationship, then I'd be happy. If only I had um, a, a less stressful job, then I'd be uh, happy. If only I had a meaningful career, then I'd be okay. If only I had somewhere um, uh, more quiet to, to live or to rest or to think, then then. Um, I'd be better off and so on. So I think we, we think about happiness primarily in the society we live in, in terms of this control mindset, in terms of how can I change the world? How can I get stuff? How can I have stuff? How can I keep hold of stuff in order to be okay or in order to be happy? And there's nothing wrong with that. There's, there's nothing wrong with that at all. Um, it's it's quite clear that, that I'm sure in all our lives um, we've got stuff um, that has improved our situation. Um, we have stuff that does make our life better. I'm not denying that. Um, again, we can kind of, to, to Susie's point about do people really know what, they're, what makes them happy? Certainly, I think we can we can obviously get this wrong. You know, we can, we can pursue, try and get stuff, try and have stuff that, that isn't so good for us. But... But all in all, like I think, you know, we don't do a terrible job at, at trying to um, change the world. We 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 often, you know, um, 
you know, try and get things that are that are reasonably good for us, like a like a job or or a home. You know, they're not. They're, it's not um, wildly um, problematic. Um, but uh, I think the the kind of key point that I want to make is there are just countless ways in which we can improve our lives. You know, this this is a great forum for, for talking about this stuff because this whole group is about ways in which we can improve our lives. And uh, if you've, you know, been around in this group for a while, you will know there are countless ways in which we can improve our lives. Um, you know, and this is what I think, you know, almost digital products do. They, they present us every single day with thousands of different ways in which we can improve our lives. You know, here's a new way in which you can be in contact with friends. Here's a new way in which you can be healthier. Here's a new way in which you can have a better diet. Here's a new way in which you... And we can do all these things, but we only have a certain amount of time in this life. We only have a certain amount of space um, to improve things. Um, so I think this kind of goes back to, to what Ness is right in one of his comments about uh, lockdown being a, a time in which people have kind of taken a step back and, and thought about what makes them happy and, and likewise Susie's point about well do people really know what makes them happy. I think people do know what makes them happy but, I, but, but there are thousands of things that make us happy and so picking the right thing uh, is is crucial um, and it, it, his, there's kind of a few uh, like well-known phenomenons that kind of point to this so, so an obvious one right is um, that we might for example achieve everything we want we might from a control mindset do really well in life um, we might get and have all the things that are on our life plan and this is what I think happens in the midlife crisis um, well documented where people aren't terribly kind of they haven't failed at life but they get to this point um, around middle age where they've actually achieved an awful lot of good stuff they might have a, a family a, a marriage they might have a successful career um, a stable home um, and then get to a point where they're like okay well I've, well, I've done it all like I've, I've I've sort of won, won from the from the control mindset point of view. Why why am I not happy? Or why do I feel like my life isn't fulfilling or right in some way? And I think this, this gets to the point that they've improved their lives in lots of ways, but they may not be the ways that matter. And, and the kind of stereotypical reaction of like a male midlife crisis where they then like go the other way and only think about like instant joy by getting a Ferrari and having an affair with a younger woman or whatever is it, clearly like not the way to go. That's clearly not the um, things that matter. Um, but there are clearly people who do commit to things, commit, have long term goals. Uh, where they really do feel that they matter and and they don't have midlife crises after achieving them. You know, we could never imagine someone, for example, like um, Martin Luther King, right, having a midlife crisis, like in the middle of the civil rights movement, like from achieving some of his goals. You know, he, he is fully behind what he's doing. He, he, he knows that those, that what he's doing is, is, maybe not good for him but but good for um the world um so there's that's kind of one thing that i think points to this problem if we only think about happiness in terms of control in terms of getting and having we can end up in the middle of our lives realizing oh i've been trying to get and have the wrong things like, I, everything i've got and, and have is, has improved my life but it's not they're not the actual things that really matter Another kind of example that points to this uh, uh, at the end of people's lives. So there's a, there's a brilliant book <clears throat> which um, people might have heard of uh, by a palliative nurse called Bonnie Ware, um, which is called the, I think it's called the Regrets of the Dying or the Common Regrets of the Dying. And she lists kind of these five um, regrets that she found that most of her patients had, well, not most, but, but frequently came up uh, from her patients throughout her career and again these, these these are people that didn't have necessarily bad lives but they look back at the end of their lives and go oh, I wish 
I hadn't spent so much time doing, I don't know, work or another example was um, doing what other people expected of me, things like that. And I had instead prioritized more um, things that matter and for these people. It's things like their relationships, maybe friendships, um, doing what they wanted, uh, their dreams, following their dreams rather than what other people expected them and so on. Yeah, so Susie's come across that one. Five regrets of the day. So that's another kind of example where our lives can kind of go to plan. Um, from the control mindset point of view, we can get and have all the things that we think make sense, but we've at some point along the way, we lost touch with what really mattered. We lost connection with the things that were most important. Maybe uh, we just didn't stay in touch with the things that we weren't able to adapt our goals. Uh, maybe we didn't have a midlife crisis, so we ended up with end of life regrets, who knows? Crisis points are the kind of last thing that I want to talk about, which is when things actually do go wrong. So for example, the, the death of a loved one or, or a mental breakdown or an addiction or something. Now, these can be terrible things that happen to people, but um, do provide people sometimes with that kind of like, um, was it Nessa was talking earlier about uh, the lockdown, you know, uh, the collective crisis has done for many people re recently, which is this, this opportunity to kind of step back and go, I need to really reassess life. I thought, I thought life was all about getting and having these things. But now this, you know, tragedy has happened. I need to get back in connection with reality, back in touch with what matters. So that's all quite a long sort of blurb about how we think about happiness primarily in, from this control mindset, from getting and having stuff to changing the world, to improving our lives. But there are traps, there are traps from this control mindset. If we're overly in this control mindset, we can become narrow in our thinking. We can have this little box of the things that we think are really important in life and that might be our day-to-day to-do -day to list or it might be our long-term goals um, and we can over time um, get stuck in this box and fail to see outside it, fail to stay in contact with the things that really matter to us. It might be actually relatively imperceptible on a kind of day-to-day -day basis. And we might just have these over time moments like a midlife crisis or I think even more tragically, end of life regrets where we realize that we haven't necessarily done what matters with our life. So what's the opposite? What's the connection mindset all about? Well, I've already um, said uh, what, that, what those capacities are. They're about our capacity to pay attention to the world, to be open uh, to what matters, to be, to be kind of more responsive to possibilities, to be a bit more flexible, a bit more adaptive, a bit more spontaneous, rather than this kind of like control-based, planned, committed form of action. Um, to have insights, to have revelations as to what is important in our lives. That's all the connection mindset. And so what does that look like in practice? Well, I think there's a various ways in which we do this. I, I'm going to just talk maybe for, for a few more minutes about this um, and then I'll, I'll open up to questions. I hope that's okay. I'm sorry if anyone has to go. Um, and uh, so, so one obvious way that I think we still um, have strongly in our society is, is love. Um, so in our loving relationships, in our intimate relationships, our kind of uh, very certain way of looking at the world, all the things that we are trying to do and achieve and get done, can kind of get blown out the window when we fall in love or, or when we uh, enter into a caring relationship with someone. Uh, and that could be a, a pet as well as a, a human. Um, where suddenly what matters is not our kind of day-to-day, -day, this is what I'm trying to get done, this is what I'm trying to have, this is what I'm trying to keep hold of. It's suddenly like the well-being of someone else. We suddenly pay attention. We can't help but pay attention to this rich inner life of an individual who is not us. There's, there's a psychologist called Eric Fromm who, who, who thought that this was the kind of almost point of human existence to go from our sort of narcissistic baby brain of um, 
uh, only caring about our own needs and only seeing reality in terms of our, our instincts and desires and so on, to a mature adult who can who can genuinely understand, can really deeply feel that there are other individuals out there who feel and think and experience as richly as we do. Um, and that's really that kind of, again, that connection mindset of, of, of sort of dropping all the ways in which we're trying to change reality and simply being open to the reality of another person. Um, so that's one way in which I think we, we, we remain in touch with what matters is through, through relationships, through intimacy, through care. And there are some other really kind of obvious ways too. So uh, obviously important ways. So, so religion is one. I mean, I, I'm not personally religious, but I have a deep respect for religion in that they, um, they really, I think, understood this connection mindset and, and indeed this balance between control and connection. Um, so religions create spaces for people to step outside their kind of practical control-based lives to you know churches cathedrals where they can have this awe inspired kind of stillness um there's different perspective on what life is all about they have um maybe cyclical rituals at different parts of the year um religions like uh, Hinduism, you know, being polytheistic, will have different kind of rituals and shrines and offerings that people can make in various different areas of their lives, whether that's their health or their work or their relationships and so on. Um, Islam will have, you know, praying five times a day, you know, uh, or, or Ramadan is a great example where for one month a year people have to um, fast, you know, during the, 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 the day. Uh, so it's for one month of the year people will be in forced to, to be in connection with their with their bodies their biological selves to really you know take that step back and, and go well you know ultimately i am a, a biological creature who needs water and food fundamentally and, and to really kind of understand that and to get an idea of what that must be like for people who don't necessarily have those things and, and so on so these sort of profound techniques these profound spaces these profound uh, timetables uh, that, that religions have, have uh, cultivated over um, centuries, uh, myths and symbols being um, things that people can kind of interact with, participate with, rather than just kind of accumulation of knowledge that is, that is science. So religion, I think, is a, is a very um, interesting one. And I think actually before um, in history, we uh, we had much more of a religious um, life in in the Western world, and um, had a less of a control control based life. And finally, there's this kind of I think uh, the area of life that I want to sort of talk about in terms of our, like activate our, our capacities for connection are are in general the, the aesthetic world. So that's things like art, creativity, spending time in nature, uh, sport, uh, and various other kind of physical activities and craft. These are things that, that again, um, take us out of our sort of practical world of, of to-do lists and goals and, and, and getting and having stuff in life and put us more into this state of absorption, of attention um, in terms of wonder uh, and and curiosity and and you know art can can make us understand like a book can make us understand or be interested in the life of another individual similar to how love can um, music can can make us pay attention to to sentiments to to emotions that we might not otherwise um, pay attention to you know experience quite sort of potentially profound revelations around what matters in life just by listening to some sounds. It's kind of crazy how music um, can do that. Uh, likewise, people engage in sport, they can, they can get into a sense of flow where it's not necessarily about achieving a particular goal or outcome, changing the, the circumstances, but more about kind of this fluid, active, responsive engagement. Um, and spending time in nature is a, a really great example of how I've certainly had this experience where 
I've had these busy days and, you know, I can't get out of the, the, the stuff that I'm thinking about all the time. Maybe that might be my work life or my home life or something. And then I go for like a walk in the woods and I, I see trees and birds who have been doing the same thing for, for decades and centuries. And it's just a, a completely different perspective on again maybe what matters on on time on you know why why are we here uh, how much time do we have here what should i be doing with my life um yeah so these are all things that i think uh, belong to this connection mindset in comparison to the kind of plans and goals and commitments and all that kind of stuff that, that belong to the control mindset and can balance it out to a certain extent. The more I think we engage in these kind of connection mindset um, activities, the more we might remain open to what matters in our lives, the more we might be able to step back from our, our kind of boxes or lists of what we think is important and, and gain new insight, new rev revelations, um, and not lose touch, not lose touch with what's, what's important. So, one thing on that though, which is very important, um, these are these it's are areas like love, like aesthetics, like uh, like art and nature and uh, religion. They're all very good at putting us into this um, connection mindset, kind of opening us up uh, to new information, to uncertainty, to the unknown. But as soon as we kind of go, aha, great, I need more of these things in my life. We're suddenly back into the control mindset where we're like, right, I'm going to have a bit of spending time with nature. I'm going to get a bit of religion. I'm going to uh, do 10 minutes of mindfulness every day. I'm going to go to church on the weekends. I'm going to, you know, and suddenly we're in back in the world of uh, goals and getting and having, which can um, kind of paradoxically um, just slightly enlarge the, the size of our box and stick in a few kind of connection activities in there which actually may not have the same power to kind of uh, make us open to, to um, create new insight to um, reveal the world for us to keep us in touch with what matters so we can kind of um, pollute these activities by coming to them with a control mindset. Now I realize that means you may be asking the question at this point, well, what, what do we do then if we can't, you know, just incorporate these kinds of activities into our goals? And, and that I think is uh, what this week is going to be about, this kind of real tension between these two um, different mindsets, between this control mindset and this connection mindset. It's so tempting to kind of be in a control mindset and go, oh, I want to get all the con connection too. Yeah, that sounds good. I want to keep in contact with reality. Yeah, so I need to plan in ways of doing that, which can unfortunately keep us uh, still blind to, to reality and the things that matter. Um, I got a question here uh, from Susie. So would you say that the more open and adaptable we are, the happier we will be? If so, how do we improve our openness, particularly for the things we don't understand or agree with? Well, yes, and and how do we how do we do this? Is is the kind of um, <laughs> yeah, that's a, so I can't schedule connection. Um, how can we be open to it instead? Yeah, so um, it's a really difficult question. Uh, it's a really difficult question, uh, and and I think I'm going to make it a little bit more difficult. Uh, Su Susie, you said, uh, how can we? Uh, improve our openness, especially for things we're scared of. I actually think we're scared of all openness. So not only can we not necessarily control being uncontrolled, <laughs> control being open, um, but uh, being open is terrifying. So I think that, and, and that's a really important thing to understand. The reason why it's so tempting to stay in our little box, the reason we can get halfway through our lives or towards the end of our lives, not necessarily having done what really matters, um, is because the unknown, the uncertainty of, of what we might be missing out on is potentially um, 
terrifying. So uh, the, the going back to the palliative nurse who's, who talks about um, the five main regrets of the dying. So one one of the main regrets is, you know, I wish I hadn't worked so hard and spent more time with loved ones. Now, that's all very well to say at the end of your life. But at the age of 30, 40, 50, where you're in a competitive career situation and so on, it's very scary to go, okay, well, I'm going to prioritize relationships over work. So I'm going to maybe work, you know, in a job where, which is only four days a week rather than five days a week, which might not put me in a position to get a promotion and so on. Or, or I might end up losing my job down the line. Who knows? Or I might not be able to be in a position to, to get the other kind of job that, that I really want because I won't have the necessary experience and so on. So the actual practical lived, um, how can I be open to what matters and then explore that in, in, in our day-to-day -day lives is really scary. We can do it at the end of our life because we know like, oh, I should have spent more time with loved ones than, being, than working. But at any time in, in the midst of life, um, it might seem like we can possibly do less work because it could have all these negative consequences. In other words, what we've already learned, everything we already know about the world, everything we think is good, everything we think is bad, all the strategies we've learned to get more of the good stuff, less of the bad stuff, that's kind of guaranteed. All our habits, all our um, uh, yeah, coping mechanisms, all our goals, they're things that we've, that we've learned and given us some success. Everything else, you know, we might have someone saying, why are you, why are you in that relationship? You're, you don't look very happy. Like, you could do so much better. They might be able to see that from the outside, but from the inside, we don't know because we've not experienced, you know, what, what the unknown is like. We've only experienced uh, what we've already learned. So, yeah, Susie, you're absolutely right. We, to some extent, spend our lives living in fear because there is this uncertainty of, of taking a leap outside of what we already know, of taking a kind of jump into this open connection mindset, um, where we will find out, we will find out, you know, what more of what matters to us, but we might find out through failure or through a breakup or through, um, physical pain you know it, or, you know it, it all kind of depends on on the sort of leaps we're making and and, and the, the openness that we are um letting ourselves uh uh prioritize so th that's the kind of framework so i realized i just rambled for a very long time um about these two differences between control and connection and, and how they play out in our lives. We're going to look at how, um, how to integrate these two capacities to some extent. We're going to look at the balance between these capacities. We're going to look at what maybe should be prioritized between control and connection at different times. So I'm going to answer all of these kind of, so what do we do <laughs> questions? Because ultimately, um, that that's the most important thing. Um, and we're also going to widen it out. So it's not just uh, avoiding these kind of crises, long term, midlife, end of life or, or tragic crises that we might happen in our lives, but also um, this plays out in our day to day lives, the way we can kind of get stuck in our problems or stuck in our relationships where we really can't see see the answer, see the, the thing that matters, see, see what we can do to, to be adaptive in our situation. Um, and I think this also plays out if we've got time, um, I'd love to look at how this plays out on a social level. So how on a society are we in little boxes when we come to think about issues like crime, when we come to think about issues like health, climate change, inequality, and how can we, in a way, as a society, have more of a connection mindset? That's something that I'm very interested in. Um, so uh, we will explore that in future uh, sessions, but I'm going to leave it um, now and uh, end this video. It's been lovely to meet you all and see you tomorrow morning.